Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom. Welcome back, Brian. Good to be back. <laughs> uh, today we're talking about Deuteronomy. We're continuing our four-part series. It's always a gamble to say how many parts are going to be in the series, but we're planning on four parts. Uh, this is part two, the series on Deuteronomy and cultural transmission. Today we're talking about social studies, the sociology of social studies. And I was just saying to Greg before we started recording that I was homeschooled. I went to Cornerstone Christian School and then I went to Hillsdale College. So I have no idea what social studies are. I took history classes all the way through. Um, and the only place I ever heard of social studies was on standardized tests. So, Greg, what are social studies? What's this thing? You know, that's the thing that no one's quite sure about. And <laughs> the the article I originally wrote that's sort of the basis for our discussion, I spent a good I, – I, just in the research, I spent a good deal – of time trying to find a standardized definition. And I had to look through a number of state educational documents from all over the place. And I finally got something along these lines. Try this. This is from, Mon well, yeah, this is from Montana. One, students access, synthesize, and evaluate information to communicate and apply social studies knowledge to real world situations. Hmm. What? <laughs> Didn't you just use the so word the in the definition? Is, the definition <laughs> of the class is, this class will teach you how to use this class in the real world. Exactly. Yeah. This Good. class will involve that. knowledge and gaining and well, using it. Well, not only, yeah, access, synthesizing, and evaluating, and communicating. And this was a English major being hired to come up with something <laughs> compelling to get state funding, wasn't it? Um, probably, yes. <laughs> um, two, students analyze how people create and change structures of power, authority, and governance to understand the operation of government, and to demonstrate civic responsibility. Hmm. Create sounds and change kinda, the structures of power. Sounds kind of Marxist. Oh, only potentially. <laughs> <laughs> you know this is a question, right? I mean, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I, Depends mm -hmm. on your definition of things. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm sure they define all this. Well, maybe not. Four. <laughs> this is this is we, sociology. For four, I don't know what happened to three. I must yeah, have what? eliminated it. Students demonstrate an understanding of the effects of time, continuity, and change on historical and future perspectives and relationships. People Presumably apply we look at the understanding past. <laughs> of order. <laughs> Presumably we're looking at the past and the Future, which is now past, to see how the past future affect or the past past affected the past future, so that we can make guesses about how our present would affect our own future, since we can't see our future. If you go to the past, <laughs> you can't change your past by because the future is now your past, but you yeah. can't now change because you went to the past. Well, so, no, but you're, you're seeing how it works, though. You know, if <laughs> if someone in 1900 did X, and in, by 1940 the result was Y. Then that probably something like that probably would happen if we did X or an X like thing today, 40 years in the future, a Y like thing would happen. Assuming that the culture, the people, and the ethical um, constraints for the above remain consistent. <laughs> Doesn't like every social studies class admit that none of that stays consistent? Yeah. It's also, kind of there's this whole complex problem about establishing causality. Like, even in science, that's a very tricky and specific also, thing to do. Like, I'm I'm being reminded of um, one of the arguments in, in a book by Carl Truman where, where he was talking about why why people don't like written creeds for the most part. It, it is a very enlightenment idea of this, you know, well, we can't listen to things from 1,200 years ago because people were so <laughs> – different then we're better we're right. more enlightened we're more evolved and uh so we, we have can't more listen, information than they did we can't listen to saint augustine because mm -hmm. he doesn't know what it's like to be a 21st century christian um 
And that I'm seeing a lot of that here. Oh, can we ring the Gnosticism <laughs> bell? Diddling. Okay. Yeah, um, a, a general statement from E. Wayne Ross in the Social Studies Curriculum 2006 says that social studies are meant to provide young people with the, quote, knowledge, skills, and values necessary for active participation in society. And the words social competence and citizen education show up a lot in these documents as a sort of a summary. We live in a society. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, but they want you to participate, not just exist. Mm. And they want you to apparently be good citizens. As one of you already said, that depends a lot on definitions, doesn't it? What does a good citizen do? Submit in all circumstances? Help the thing grow and change positively? Change it dramatically now because anything less is compromised and, and uh, packed with hell. There is so much here that is not said. And in an older generation, did, did, a lot of people didn't feel you needed to say it because we all believe and assume the same things, right? We all know and, what it means to be a good American. Yeah. And unfortunately, they did. Mm -hmm. And they were wrong. But they all, <laughs> thought, they all thought they knew. Uh, and, and that's kind of where we're going with this. Social studies draws from economics, history, geography, government, sociology, anthropology, psychology, with elements of the humanities, such as literature, musical, uh, visual arts, and such. But these are presented in traditional uh, social studies courses, not as a chronological story. And we're going to be talking, I think, next week more about the idea of, well, a little bit this week, but more next week about the uh, history as communicating a people's story, one's own story, one's family's story. Uh, these are not stories. Stories you do not find. If they, if you do, it's that little breath of fresh air that's, that slips in real fast and is gone. Because this is science. Mm -hmm. It's science, man, and we don't do stories. We have facts. We have statistics. We have graphs. We have Data. charts. Data. Yeah, because we want to so – numbers, things that can be quantified because we want this to be science. We're studying society scientifically. Is it any wonder that Lewis uh, and Rush to me both had a kind of uh, paranoid fear of sociology? Because <laughs> this is what you're doing. You're you're treating us like you're treating humanity like beetles under a microscope. We know what happens to the beetles. Mm -hmm. It's not we know what happens yeah. to the rats in the maze. <laughs> exactly. Paul Simon told us in his song. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. You, you kind of wonder how they how they put historical data into uh, or historical events into like numerical form. You're just like, all right, so one Weimar <laughs> Republic is equal to uh, the passage of time plus the depression equals one Hitler. <laughs> I think you need some yeah, calculus kind of symbols <laughs> integrating like the Weimar Republic from. Uh, poverty to Empire. victory uh, over is equal to Hitler. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. So we just read "Foundation" by Isaac Asimov. Oh, good, good thing oh. to bring in right now. Yeah, Brian, so Brian, are you familiar with it? I'm. I I know it exists, and I haven't read <laughs> yeah. it yet. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You really need to because uh, unfortunately, it fits exactly here. Emily, go ahead with what you were going to say. Yeah, it's it tracks a community. I guess I'll be honest, it's not my genre, and we were listening to it on audiobooks, which are not my medium. So I was spacing out for a solid 85% of the last part of the book. But the first part of the book was about the psycho historian Harry Seldon, who has quantified to the point of being able to predict events far into the future with a great probability of accuracy. Um, he can't predict individual actions because there are too many unknowns. But as you broaden your field of data that you're using and give it enough time, he's got this like wizard like prophetic power. Um, and it's leveraged in different ways as time progresses through this society. Yeah, it's presented as purely mathematical as long as you're dealing with with groups that are large enough, say, the size of a planet, mm. and time periods that are long enough, say, decades or centuries, then the, the assumption is human nature is pretty consistent. 
uh, the laws of economics and politics are pretty consistent. So you can you can predict the future, barring things like, and I think it was uh, Robert Nisbet who says barring things like the genius, the maniac, and the catastrophe. <laughs> Nisbet goes on to say, unfortunately. <laughs> Those are the three <laughs> things that keep showing up all the time. <laughs> and, well, it kind of remind that almost reminds me of um, the TV show Person of Interest. Yes. Uh, I don't know if either of you okay, yes. you're familiar with it. Uh, uh-huh. Where you basically get this there's a machine that it watches everyone and it basically learns everything and eventually starts to do things like predict the future and predict when people are going to try and uh you know, break into where its uh, files are stored in hard copy, so it like moves itself. Yeah, it it orders itself through various levels of government to be moved, and characters show up, and one of them is really weird who starts calling it a god, and yes. it's like, oh, this is sounding familiar too. <laughs> <laughs> um, not to not to give away too much about Foundation, but eventually in. Um... I don't know if it's the end of the second book or the, the third book. The the weird manifestation, the mutant shows up that throws everything off. And what you eventually learn is that um, it's not quite as scientific as we've been led to believe. If we if he actually had told everyone what's really going on, it would have been far too easy to thwart. So he so one of the the things that's going on is he's deliberately creating the aura that. This is science. This mm. is unstoppable. This is for your best. We have it all figured out. Nothing could possibly go wrong. Trust us. And it turns out, yeah, a lot actually could go wrong, but there's a backup plan that they don't know about mm. because science has its limitations after all, and they're pretty severe. But yeah, that's the kind of thing we're, we're talking about. When we come out of the Enlightenment, basic idea was, in the light of Newton's Principia, that if the heavens themselves can be reduced to mathematical formulas, everything can. Human nature, human society, economics, the flow of history, government, everything can be quantified and uh, dissected in a mathematical way following Descartes and uh, Newton. And once we do that, once we have enough data and we know the rules, we can, yes, tell the future, but we can also manipulate the future. And we will do that for the good of the world. And the ironic thing was at that point, the good that they were talking about still bore the heavy impress impress of Christianity. You know, we're going to care for the poor and love one another, not kill each other, not steal. But the more consistent members of that society said, yeah, you got guys got a problem. You've denied God, but you're still acting as if his rules matter. That's inconsistent. And there was a generation there that struggled between, but no, we got rid of superstition because it was the problem and it kept us from realizing an ideal society. When it's all based on us, it should be so much better. Hmm. Turned out it wasn't. (laughs) And you can look at Marxism, Nazism, and American technocracy, and you get the same thing. We have the science. We have the math. We have the smart people. We have the big data. Yeah. And, and give us this, give us time, give us power, give us information, comprehensive information. And uh, what we will give you will be scientifically accurate. You can trust it as science. And our priests wear these lab coats and these pocket protectors and their glasses are broken in the center and tape. You know, that's how you recognize the priesthood now. Um, Oculus Repero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Hermione. <laughs> Oh, uh, um, side note: one of my favorite moments in the Goblet of Fire audiobook is is where Crumb is is talking to her, and she's trying to tell him how to pronounce her name, and he uh-huh. keeps calling her Hermione. <laughs> <laughs> as, as I recall, um, J.K. Rowling said, "Got a letter from someone who said, I, I'm, I'm, some people are telling me now it's Hermione, but I look at it, it's Hermione.'" Um, and she wrote back, well, here you can pronounce it however you like. Don't let them boss you around. <laughs> the, first time, the first time she realized, you know, people don't know how to pronounce that word. I, yeah. That's probably a bad choice on names. Nope. Uh, anyway. <laughs> oh, um, the, uh, the 
man who the man uh, E. Wayne Ross, who wrote uh, Social Studies Curriculum, the first introduction to the whole thing, uh, gave some background. We said, well, almost in passing, of course, the beginning of our country, basic moral instruction, that the, the, the kind of thing that we now do with social studies was grounded in religion, particularly instruction in the Bible and the catechism. Whoa, surprise, <laughs> surprise. You mean we, the church once had a way of preparing their children for engagement in society and involved an infallible textbook and a very fallible, but nonetheless very competent explanation thereof, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What thought? And, it, 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 and this is what people did for generations. I mean, as late as Anne of Green Gables, you're reading along and it says Anne, Anne had to go memorize her catechism. No <laughs> one today knows what that means unless you belong to Presbyterian or Reformed Church, maybe Luther. Well, Catholic, I guess. Anglican. Um, but the average evangelical is, what's that? Catechism? <laughs> but when, Kate Chisholm. Yeah. But when um, Lucy Montgomery was writing, she assumed everybody knew what a catechism was because everybody did, not just Presbyterians. The Westminster Shorter Catechism formed one of the key elements of education for anybody who went to any kind of religious school or they had some uh, version uh, altered by the Baptist or whoever congregationalist, but the basic questions, who made you, um, I'm sorry, the, those, that's a children's version. Um, <laughs> what is the chief end of man to glorify God and enjoy perfect? Everybody knew that. But then there came problem. And uh, once the revolution was over, the, the, the problem was, we now have 13 former colonies, now states, with their own history and identity Mostly that identity has been defined not only ethnically, but religiously or denominationally. In the Dutch, you have the Dutch Reformed. In Pennsylvania, maybe you have some Lutherans. In um, Pennsylvania, you've got some Quakers. In the Carolinas and Virginia, you've got ex-Anglicans, because you can't be Anglican anymore, so you're Episcopalian now. <laughs> uh, Massachusetts, you've got the Congregationalists, who used to be called Puritans. And these all have their own religious settlements, their own doctrinal distinctives, and they used to be very, very jealous of these, and they continued to be jealous of them. But along the way, they learned, you know, we have these differences, but that doesn't mean we have to kill each other over them. Step forward. Good thing. <laughs> the problem is, okay, then how do we relate? And the answer came to be, well, let's just leave that to the church and the family, and in the public sector, we'll come up with some other common ground particularly in the realm of education, because now we want to educate everybody together in a way that will befit this new republic. We got rid of the church calendar. Baptists and congregations don't particularly use it. So we're not going to be setting up the saints as heroes. Augustine who? Um, Athanasius what? Patrick? Isn't he Roman Catholic? You know, and so we now need new heroes like Washington, and Adams, and Franklin, and Patrick Henry. But we also need a new curriculum that's going to emphasize the things that are basic to what this nation needs. Virtues like bravery, honesty, self-reliance, temperance, big one. And temperance actually meant abstinence, industry, hard work, and, uh, of course, patriotism. The goal here was to produce patriotic citizens, loyal to now to the nation and not just to their state. Because the people felt that was necessary if this is going to work. We can't be single-minded and just focus upon the small little area we know. We have to have a love for America. We have to have American heroes, an American calendar, American history. But if we do that, if we start teaching the Bible, which whose interpretation? We, you teach it mm -hmm. as if we're Quakers, as if we're Baptists, as if we're Presbyterians, Calvinists, Arminians. What exactly? And... The argument that came back was, well, we'll just pick a generic theism, a generic Christianity, the things that all Christians agree on. Oh, and remember that Christians include deists and Unitarians. Uh, we're going to pick all the things that they agree on, and we will teach those and teach them to respect the Bible and, and God in heaven, who's our creator, whatever that means. And uh, But we'll never teach any doctrinal distinctives. We'll leave that to the churches. So no one needs to be afraid, afraid of sending your child to the local public school, even before they were called public schools. 
And in fact, we need a curriculum that will do this. And there was this guy named McGuffey <laughs> that was hired to do this. Now, I don't know about you. I grew up in a school that used McGuffey's readers. And the logic was that there's more moral lessons here. There's You're not going to have to apologize for the language or, or any such thing. And it, it reflects the basic Christian worldview. And I never questioned it. I was a kid when I read those. In fact, we even had our, our oldest daughter read some of them when she got ahead of her reading level. But at one point, my wife was tasked with writing an article. You can find it online. Kate Edinger, Old Gruff and His Readers, uh, Levin Magazine, um, Volume 7, Number 4. She was asked to, to write this article. And so we said, well, you know, we, we've gotten kind of skeptical of uh, of the McGuffey's readers. You, to do him justice, we need to read them or at least skim them pretty thoroughly. And so we went through all of them, mm -hmm. looking at each story in turn. We were looking for something very specific. We were looking for references to Jesus. We found about two in the entire series that clearly referenced anything that might be considered revealed religion. There was one on God as creator, and it comes toward the end of the series. And there was one on Jesus emphasizing how kind and good and, and unusual he was as a human mm. being. That was it in the entire series. Lots about being moral, no hint of what the gospel may be, and almost no reference to God directly. Mm. Uh, it was frightening. And so that was the compromise that lasted from, um, I don't know if I have this date where Duffy first wrote or not. Apparently not, but in into the early 1900s, his was, that, that was what people learned from. And that's why so many Christian schools, when I was a kid, it's no, Christian schools were coming online, had no curriculum. They went back to McGuffey's readers and says, oh, this is what our Christian forefathers used. Mm -hmm. you, you know, there's always a problem with going back to yesterday, because yesterday is what got us to today. <laughs> And just going back and saying, let's undo the flaws and not change anything. We're going to relive them again, except we're going to relive them a generation behind time. So they're going to be even less applicable and useful. I've known people within Christian educational circles who have argued, let's go back and adopt John Locke. We tried that. It got <laughs> us here. Someone said, well, we can't use biblical arguments because unbelievers don't listen to the Bible, but they'll listen to Locke. One, no, they won't. Two, wait, isn't that exactly the problem? They won't listen to the Bible. So you're coming up with something that's not the Bible, but this seems to you like some kind of compromise? Anyway, side issue, but not by much. Somewhere in the 1916, I believe, the Bureau of Education published Social Studies in Secondary Education. It was a report from the Committee on Social Studies shared by Thomas um, Jesse Jones, and he used the word social studies for the first time. Well, nearly the first time. It's one of the first writers to use them. But he'd actually used the words earlier in an article appearing in the Southern Workman. Southern's important here. Hmm. Because the article wasn't theoretical. He was describing an existing curriculum used at the Hampton Institute. And anybody who's read uh, articles on um, uh, Booker T. Washington will recognize that. The Hampton Institute was an institute for training young black men to integrate, well, to fail to integrate into white society because the argument was you can't. Mm. Therefore, what you need to do is not follow the leader of the socialist agitators and the Marxist agitators and stir up trouble. You just need to be calm and submissive and non-emotional. And if you hang out with white people enough and learn to discipline your passions and learn to be hard, nice workers, in a few generations, eventually your great great grandchildren will evolve to the spot where they can have they can enjoy the full benefits of being free people in a free society. But don't try to rush it because evolution, you know, takes its hmm. time. In that racist, <laughs> yeah, that's racist. Yeah, first of all, it assumes that there is such a thing as race. Now, for those of you who haven't worked your way all through this series. Please go back and listen to the episode. You can hear pages turning as he looks at the table of contents. Um, the one that's called Of One Blood, I believe, mm -hmm. which is our discussion of the whole idea of the non-existence of race 
in God's creation. God did not create races. He created people. He created one human race. And he always analyzed it in terms of covenantal groupings, nations, languages, people, groups, families. The one exception being tongues. And, but since at Babel, the tongues were divided very explicitly, we're told, according to their families. The Bible does not recognize this race thing. Biology may have some use for it. I'm highly suspicious of that. It, it sounds like it stinks of hell. But the Bible certainly never acknowledges it. There is, there's, there's no such thing as race. People grow up with different cultural backgrounds. And we talked, we have earlier episodes talking about that, the effect of religion, as well as other circumstances on culture. But so the first thing about racism is that race is not a thing. So to make race a dividing issue over anything is about as bad as saying, okay, you people are all from Pluto and you are all from Venus. So the Pluto Plutonians, you're over there, you people from Venus out there in the work camp. And uh, that's just the way it's going. This is mythology. <laughs> this is science fiction. <laughs> There's no such thing. The second thing, of course, is a simple violation of the gospel. Jesus died for men of all sorts without qualification. In Christ, no Jew, no Gentile, barbarian, Scythian, bond, no free. Uh, Christ is all, and, and we and him are one collective body, the New Jerusalem. And the New Jerusalem doesn't wipe away these distinctives. It glorifies them and uses them. Uh, and, and, and so we, we say without hesitation, racism is first stupid, and secondly, it's a sin. Mm -hmm. It's a hatred of other people who are the image of God. And even if that hatred is a nice hatred, I just want to help these poor people. If you're treating them as less than the image of God, if you're treating them as your pets, however sweet, that's racism, that's hatred. That's when you consider somebody who is the image of God as being less than the image of God, and that's your justification for being nice, nice to them. That's still hatred. It's just a sweeter, sugary kind of hatred and contempt. So, yeah, what we're looking at here, and, and interestingly huh. enough, this whole thing, Michael... Um, Leibacher, who writes about this whole thing in, uh, in a book that is in biography. Uh, the book biography you know, Origins but, of the Modern Social Studies. That would be it. History of Education Quarterly. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. He says this. Um, Hampton students were taught that social evolution, however slow, was inevitable and, quote, only time and the continued influence of whites were required for blacks to reach the level of the Anglo-Saxons. Mm -hmm. And he says that throughout, either he, I think it's him or it's the other writer, Jones. Oh, yes. The assumption that races and institutions were subject to the law of evolution was common to all Hampton social studies. So, yeah, is this racist? Yeah, it's evolutionary. And we go back to the subtitle of Origin of Species, which very few people seem to know. Darwin subtitled his classic work on the origin of species by means of, um, well, what's the next phrase? Natural, Natural selection. selection. Natural selection. Or, subtitle, the preservation of favored races. And some people say, well, no, he's talking about races of animals. Excuse me, that's what he's <laughs> arguing man is. Mm -hmm. So, no, that doesn't, that's not a, an escape hatch for you. Nope. And uh, I. Uh, well, just, it's just a return to the Greek continuity of being anyway. Yeah. Yeah. There's some things where some, some of God is a little more equal than other parts of God for now, but, you know, give us time. Um, I uh, found a, a Barnes and Noble, what was supposed to be a facsimile copy of the original. It was back some anniversary of uh, of Origin of Species. And I looked at the cover. The subtitle was missing. I looked at the inside title page. It was missing. Uh, it was followed by lots and lots of introduction, introductory essays. And finally, when you got to the facsimile title page, mm. it finally was there. But that was deep in the book of mm. the reprint. Because people don't want to talk about it. But yeah, we are dealing with an, with the reality that Darwinism leads to Racism, inevitably, because some races have got to be more evolved than others. Darwin saw that. He, he didn't have a problem. You know, I mean, he was- Hashtag like, cancel Darwin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if only. <laughs> yeah. And he was a little sad that he, in one, in the ascent of, uh, descent of man, he wrote at one point um, that um, it's, it's kind of sad that 
one day um, we're going to wipe out all of the uh, the larger primates on the one end and all the lower semi-human races on the other, like uh, the Australian uh, Aborigines and such, so that the distance will now be from the littlest monkey to the modern white man. And that beautiful ladder that we see still stretching from the one to the other will all be gone and we won't even remember it. Thanks, Chuck. That's just <laughs> so noble of you to weep a tear over that. But what comes out of this then is that uh, sociology and social studies exist then to create a workforce that will be docile, useful, productive. And of course, the question becomes useful to whom? And for Who, what? For what? Who's calling or the for shots? Home. Yeah. Well, here's a, a quote from Leibarger again. Um, this suggests the black people in the South, at least, constituted a working class, and one object of the Hampson social studies was to legitimate and perpetuate that status. This affords insights into the appeal the Hampton social studies might have held for educators and their wealthy, wealthy patrons, especially in the North. After 1900, these people became concerned with the educational problem presented by the increasing number of immigrants from Central and Eastern Europe. These newcomers and their children had to be educated. Their education had to be a special type, assisting them in making the best of their lot and securing their allegiance to the world of work as well as existing political, economic, and social arrangement. The educators confronted with such a problem, a social studies curriculum designed to inculcate the virtues found in the Hampson social studies must have seemed especially attractive. We've got a lot of people from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe now settling in America. How can we teach them to be docile and productive and not cause trouble? Oh, wait, we have a template. How did we teach these young black guys? It's kind of frightening. And, and so as we go on into the 21st and 20th and 21st century, the question becomes, well, that was the goal then. Is that still the goal? But unfortunately, as good Hegelians, we're always synthesizing. That was, that was the, the template then. We need workers for our new world order. But now when we need to push the old world order out of the way, topple it, we need to teach the young people how to do some toppling. We need to teach them how to be revolutionaries, how to question everything. Ta-da! The children of the 60s mm -hmm. who got their brain stuff with this kind of nonsense. And remember, we read the definitions. Sometimes it was understand your culture and participate. Other times it was evaluate it and change it. And you know, I think said, that's Marxist. Yep. Perfect vehicle when the time came. Because the people who came at the beginning of the process had a different end goal than the people who were the product of the process. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> that as things change, the people who are changed don't believe what the founders had in mind. They see a newer picture. Um, and so the question toward what goal and by what standard become really, really important. Three things that we're told that today social studies are supposed to do are three different approaches. One says they ought to transmit facts and values from the academic disciplines. That's, you know, treated like a science. Two, they ought to function as a means of cultural transmission, a way of achieving cultural continuity from generation to the next. It's broadly conservative in the sense of, okay, how what, what's our past? We want to keep that going. But the third is, the third would have social studies emphasize reflective inquiry and inform social criticism. Students ought to learn to question and critique American society. Remember, students here are all the age of 13 and 14. Yeah, they're going to be great critics of something they know nothing <laughs> about. The goal here is the promotion of social transformation and the reconstruction of American society. And this is the one that seems to be most favored today. The most fervent speak of racial and economic justice and a new social order. Um, so a lot of these things on the face of them seem fairly innocuous. Like we've got facts and values. It's a good thing to pass on to your kids. Like they should know that. <laughs> Cultural continuity and stability. Like that's pretty good. You don't want things toppled from generation to the next. And then you do want kids to think critically and right. like we do a lot of that on this podcast is of looking at America and saying, hmm, why are we here and where should we be? So clearly there's 
there's something going on under the hood here. <laughs> yeah. As my wife and children are fond of asking, by what standard? Mm-hmm. So your values. It's, it's great to have values, right? <laughs> well, what are they? <laughs> what are they? <laughs> I'm you a know. big fan of values. Me too. Me too. What are yours? I'm a big fan of values <laughs> that I don't want you to know about. Yeah. I mean, you know, we ha- should have multiple wives so we can fill our the world with our spirit children. Um, that's a family. That's a family value for one cult. Literally a family value. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's as family as you can get. The Manson family. Mm-hmm. They, have they have family values. values. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. But there was a time when people would just scoff at that, like, no, you know what we mean. Uh, oh, because do we? <laughs> there was a time when it was blurred enough that people could get wide with that, saying, oh, you know what I mean. We sure don't anymore. Uh, there mm-hmm. were a few voices in the past, like uh, Gresham Machen, who who warned of the dangers of an educational, public educational system. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the early 20th century, then you get uh, Cornelius Van Til and some others. But by and large, Americans have been, Christian Americans have been really stupid. Well, you know, values like, you know, be, be a good neighbor and, and, and love your neighbor and work hard. And this is sounding really familiar. And all of those things require definition. Today, in the midst of the coronavirus, the most common thing is, well, don't you love your neighbor? Don't you love grandma? Okay, we're, we're getting some, some dubious deductions and implications here that have not been reasoned out but are just said again and again and again, because that's what's going over social media. And you have not proved your ability to think, to analyze critically, but your ability to swallow whole all kinds of propaganda. And so, yeah, you're not thinking. So in, until you have definitions and until you have a standard, and until that standard is the word of God and those definitions come from scripture, all of this formality yeah, worldviews can be clear because the Bible, here, here's the thought, because the Bible is in fact true, and it's a scripture in the human nature and the way humans interact is accurate. That is that man is a covenantal being. You, There are basic questions you can ask of every culture and there will be answers. Who or what's in control? How is that control represented to society? How shall we then live? What is the, the motive force that changes human hearts and human society. And what about the next generation? Those are the five points of covenantalism. And every society has a response to them. And so just to say, yeah, we have answers for all those is a non-answer answer. No kidding, you have an answer. What is it? And how'd you get it? And what are you going to do with it? And how many people will be alive once you're done? Mm -hmm. You think of the French Revolution. Well, we're only going to eliminate you know, up to a third of the French population, or was it to eliminate it? Yeah, it's clear as to how many people they wanted to kill. In the killing fields of Cambodia, it was more like, what, 80, 90% of people they wanted to get rid of? Because it's easier to work fewer people. You have to break a lot of eggs to make it to an omelet, it seems. Uh, and Nationwide so, omelet. Yeah, <laughs> the basic question of who is God? What is real? What in the world are we talking about? has got to be a starting point. If we do not start from scripture and say, the creator God of the Bible, who reveals himself in Genesis 1 as the one who made heaven and earth in six days, any other God, or as Brian said earlier, back to the continuity of being thing, where the universe is simply a projection of God, where God, God's in us, and whatever we do in the long run is as good as anything else because there are no absolutes. It might be good for us, for the moment, but someone else will no doubt reject it. But that's okay, because we'll be dead. Until we find out how to make ourselves live forever, and that'll be scary. <laughs> and um, moving sort of now toward a conclusion. Deuteronomy. Remember, we're supposed to be talking about Deuteronomy. <laughs> you notice how much of this is not in Deuteronomy? <laughs> There's nothing like any of this in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy comes to us and says, look, I'm God. Here's my track record with you. Here's history. Here's how you don't get to me. You don't make images. You do submit to my laws and my court system. Here are my laws. Here's how you should live. If you're a redeemed people, if you're walking with me, if you know me or my laws in your heart, this is what's there and this is what I will keep on writing there. Starting with love God, love your neighbor. Here are the Ten Commandments. Here are applications and explanations of them. And then um, here are the blessings and cursings that will pursue your society depending on how you relate to me 
And here are some practical ways of transmitting all this into the next generation. And one key element again and again is history. Tell the story. And, and that's what we're going to, I believe we're going to talk about yeah, um, next yeah. week. History is story. Mm -hmm. But it's just, and feel free to throw things in here, but just, just some ideas of how that works. My, uh, our, our school has a lot of um, Slavic immigrants, mostly second or third generation now. And when my wife, she works with a lot of the younger kids, junior high students, she'll mention something about the Cold War or Soviet Empire or how bad things were, persecution of Christians. And her students will just kind of sit there and stare at her blankly like, what? Haven't your grandparents told you about this? Well, we don't talk to our grandparents about things like this. Okay, here's your assignment. <laughs> Go find your grandparents or the oldest uh, living person of your uh, family you can and ask them to tell you what life was like in Russia, in the Ukraine, in Poland, in Romania, before the curtain fell, and see what they say. And the kids will come back and say, whoa, <laughs> we had no idea. You think in time that might have an effect on how they view their world and their privileges here? I hope so. But it can't happen until we talk to them. And so social studies, by its very nature, by eliminating story, replacing it with abstract facts, does exactly what it's not supposed to do. It short circuits continuity. We need to know whose story we're in and what part we play. If we're part of a story, we know instinctively that stories have meaning. Because stories have a plot and they go someplace. When they have a theme, they rush toward a conclusion. And that conclusion is a meaningful one. If we're in a story, then that's cool. You know, as, as a teacher, particularly even teaching adults, the moment I go from, okay, here's theology, 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 let me tell you a story. Everyone sits up and brains up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, I got you all back now. <laughs> uh, that's, and you read through the Bible. Why is the Bible so much history? I wonder. <laughs> do, you, do you two have any um, recollection stories or insights along these lines that you would like to share? Times when you told stories or heard stories or heard about stories? <laughs> um, there's a lot of times I've, I've heard about stories. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I'll tell you real fast what the story I get asked for the most is. Mm -hmm. How did you meet Mrs. Eddinger? <laughs> and I've never had anyone fall asleep in that story. <laughs> Logic, because she's a really cool character and larger than life. And everyone, oh, she was so cool there. Yeah, she was. <laughs> she is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I remember teaching in sixth grade. Every time I said, pause, story time from Miss Peterson's college days. Yeah. Everyone got very interested. <laughs> yeah, of course. And, and sometimes they, if you have connected with them at all, they actually do kind of want to know about you. Mm -hmm. One young man in my class now, I'll sit with him and a couple of his friends at break, or not at break, at uh, whatever you call it when they're not doing anything, study hall. And he'll just turn to me and just ask me random questions about my past <laughs> and my interests <laughs> and my case. All right, well, it sounds like you really want to know. I'm not sure why or why you care, but okay, I'll tell you. That was the last <laughs> time I told the story of, my, uh, of our courtship. <laughs> and he was, you know, like everyone else, like, oh, that's so cool. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I can think of another one, but it, it's not actually me personally. It doesn't have to be you. Just oh, I know. Just say the stories. One of the one of the things that um, my my now fiance loves uh, about me is that I will tell her historical events in very entertaining ways, <laughs> and she's just like. Why wasn't what did you what was it you said like if if uh if you were teaching history class like I don't I don't care about history but I'm actually interested when you're telling it because it's highly entertaining because it's just <laughs> I've, I turn it into a story and like you make a great professor a history professor oh okay then I almost went I actually almost went that path really? see yeah. I keep that telling you Brian you were born to be a teacher. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and it's uh it's great. Like one of my favorite history books I've ever read is Rubicon by Tom Holland. Mm -hmm. And it's because I've recommended it on this podcast before, yeah. but it is because it opens with a hook. 
and he is an excellent writer. And throughout the entire book, it is just like, I I have never been more focused on anything in my entire life. This is an amazing story. And it's mm-hmm. it's the same stuff about Rome. Like, a lot of people know the de- some of the details about Rome, but he just crafts a story out of it. And like, you're interested. You're, yeah. you're, mm-hmm. you're pulled in. It's like, I think everyone, everyone who wants to be a history book writer needs to read Tom Holland first and determine if they can reach that level because really <laughs> nothing else is, is, is worth reading. <laughs> yeah. I had a professor say one time that history is the purest form of storytelling because it's the kind where you actually can't make anything up. <laughs> so you have the data to work with. So the art of crafting the story is putting these pieces together. And that's where your craft gets honed. Um, and the purest form of history is biography, because then your start point and your end point are defined. You don't get to decide those. <laughs> yes. And I, I mean, what makes the musical Hamilton so popular is this concept of story. We're going to not only get to know these individuals or a creative representation of these individuals, and tell their story. And the story belongs to them in the way that we want our stories to belong to us. That's why the finale is so powerful. Who lives, who dies, who tells your story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Stories are, and actually that remind that reminds me, that's a point that Gresham Machen makes mm-hmm. in Christianity and Liber- uh Christianity and liberalism, where he he basically talks about you know the reason that Christianity is so effective and has changed the world so much is because it is primarily a story mm-hmm. that yes is made up of true historical facts, but it is, it's it's a story. It's not something that is could have happened yesterday and be just as true as if it had happened three thousand years ago or the answers or the methods to greater spiritual enlightenment that will be true in all ages. It's a thing that happened in history. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it it's an event that demarcated history from then going forward. Mm-hmm. BCAD. Yeah. Well, we'll we have... talk more about that next mm-hmm. time. And yeah. Emily. Oh, I was just going to say, we have a God who steps into history because he created history. Uh, it's, it's, Unique. I was going to say very unique, but of course that's foolish. <laughs> redundantly redundant. Mm. A God who not only steps into history, but whose work history is. It yeah. is his workmanship. Mm-hmm. Not in some deistic sense of right. knocking over the dominoes and letting them fall because he <laughs> planned it so wonderfully, but actively being involved and bringing about mm-hmm. each event personally. This is something I keep trying to hit my kids with this, and maybe I'm not doing it right or I'm missing something. But I use this analogy. What if your true love were to send you a letter and say, here's what I've been up to. Here's the stuff I've been doing. And you glance at it and say, oh, more of that stuff and toss it away. And mom or dad says, aren't you, you just got a letter from your fiance. Aren't you going to read it? No, nah, just telling me about what he's been doing and <laughs> the, his job and stuff. I mean, when he starts saying something important, I'll, I'll, I'll read it. But that's, you know, that's no big deal. I, I question you whether you actually <laughs> love this person. I, of course right. you question that. Because when you love somebody, you want to know all about them. You need to know all about you. Um, <laughs> That's the nature I of love. I know you. I want uh, uh, that's <laughs> mysticism. <laughs> <laughs> but even in mysticism, you have to know them. You have to walk with them once upon a dream. Or <laughs> All right. Yeah, let's go to recommendations. Now, do I even have my recommendation notebook in this room? I do oh, not. you're making a notebook of it. I've had a notebook with my stuff in it for the past... However many episodes I've been on here, <laughs> it never occurs to me to do that. So uh, but I do. I, I will have. I do. I. I still have a recommendation off the top of my head, so it'll work out. <laughs> okay. What's awesome. What is it? I'm going to recommend cheese curds. <laughs> Again? You did that last time you were in Wisconsin. I don't care. <laughs> They're worth recommending a second time. <laughs> All right. All right. What is this cheese curd thing you speak up? Uh, che- what what is a cheese curd like? What, what, <laughs> it's cheese. Really, oh, what what, is what what kind of curd? Yeah, it's part of the 
cheese making process. Oh, okay. Um, is it is it like curds and whey just with cheese? It, yeah, it's taking the curds out of curds and whey. Yeah. Okay, so it's that. And then <laughs> curds, you, you take that and, whey. and you batter it and fry it. And it is... Fry it. Okay, I didn't see that coming. We need to do it ourselves. It's, yeah, that, it's like the it Midwestern version out, of French fries. The Midwestern version of French fries. I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's its own thing. It's it's really it's really quite delicious. And um, there's there's a few places out here that are like a cut above the rest. Culvers. Uh, not Culvers actually. No? no, there's a couple of specialized. Like, oh wow. Duke of Devon. What was the one that was number one that you mentioned? That I think is number one. Do they do the beer battered cheese curds? Beer battered cheese curds. Oh, they're really oh. good. I'm mm. just really having trouble visualizing this. So I'll, have to look, <laughs> I'll have to look for an opportunity to sample them in real life. Yes. I don't know that th there's not many places out there that, have, unfortunately, <laughs> it is very much a Midwest I, thing. But uh, yeah, I just realized I'm, I recommended an only Midwest thing to people who mainly listen from California. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Yeah. We've got a few listeners in the Midwest. Okay, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Emily, what's uh, yours? Um, mine is three poems, but especially one poem. Um, this I came upon these poems as part of a reading challenge. I was supposed to ask a child in my life for a book recommendation. Ah. So oh. I have a seven-year-old buddy at church named Robert. And I said, Robert, I need a book recommendation. And he said... Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Oh, so this is a way. How old is this kid? He's seven. And nice. you know, He's Gawain great. and the Green Knight. Okay. Yeah. Which which version? I oh. purchased J.R.R. Tolkien's I was going to say, did, you get, did yep. you get Tolkien's? Okay. I did. Yes. And so this is one volume with three poems, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, Pearl, and Sir Orfeo. Sir Orfeo is, as you might guess, Orpheus and Eurydice. Um, but the Anglo-Saxon version, which has a happy ending, which I appreciate. <laughs> um, but my favorite of the three poems was Pearl. Um, it's kind of the most personal. Um, there's reason to believe that all of these poems were written by the same author. Uh, we don't know who that is, but they are part of the Anglo-Saxon canon, as it were. And Pearl is from the perspective of a father who has lost a daughter, it sounds like. He speaks of her metaphorically as a pearl, a jewel that mm. he lost, and it rolled into the garden. And he sort of stumbles over to the garden and has this vision where he sees the girl um, decked out in pearls in bright array. And she talks to him about how happy she is in heaven um, with Jesus being part of the bride of Christ. So it's a really beautiful poem, um, really sweet, and I recommend it. Okay, well, you just outclassed me because <laughs> I'm going to steal from you and recommend the Foundation Trilogy. Ah, ah as, there we go. Or the ever in, ever increasingly misnamed Foundation Trilogy <laughs> because when, when Asimov wrote it, it was just going to be the, this trilogy. And then later on, he added another book and then another book. And then he made connecting links to every other series he ever wrote. Oh, no. So that now to appreciate the full force of what's going on, you have to read the later books, the sequ the prequels that he wrote, oh, no. and his other his all of his robot novels, like iRobot and all the ones that followed, and <sighs> his space novels. So this is yeah. sounding like uh, <laughs> Frank Herbert syndrome. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, it, it mm -hmm. except Frank Herbert kind of planned it, and, and oh, Asimov true. just kind of he had his ideas out there and then realized, wait, if I just have them run into each other, the two universes match, then all of that becomes backstory for all of this. And it explains the next thing I'm going to do. I'm going, and yeah, anyway. The original <laughs> trilogy, as um, Emily sort of introduced it, starts with this idea of psychohistory. We can use mathematics to predict how people will act and predict the future. And what he shows us is the various ways that cultures can evolve and adapt, starting with, well, it starts with this. The, we, we have the Galactic Empire that's like the Roman Empire in its decline. It's about ready to totter and fall. And this intrepid group of encyclopedias, psychohistorians, 
are trying to find a way. Well, they can't save it, they realize, but to create a new universe, a new uh, galactic empire on the other side that will be more stable. But in order to do that, they 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 come up with the idea of let's put an outpost on the very edge of the galaxy. And we will put scholars there who are dedicated to one thing in producing a summary of all man's knowledge, and we'll call it the Encyclopedia uh, Galactica. <laughs> Except it's all a lie. And we move through the stories as we finding out as we find out exactly how much everybody's been lied to and why the lie is necessary to perpetuate the plan. It's subsidiary and eventually falls away because the plan is much deeper, much sneakier. And even when you find out what the plan is, oh, but that's not even that's not the real plan. Oh, no. And so by the time you, you think you've got it all figured, OK, so in order for this little this little island of civilization to survive, the one thing they have is atomic power. Well, that's the first thing everyone loses track of. So now they've got their little edge in. Oh, but wait, people won't accept it unless you're presented as magic in a religion. So. Here's how religion can enslave and transform cultures. Okay, well, people eventually realize that. So that doesn't work. Then we can go to the free market. Oh, the free market can transform. And it keeps going with new ways of pushing cultural uh, advancement, pushing civilization. But all the time for our conspiracy buffs, there's something going on here, something suspicious, something behind the scenes. And only once the mutant shows up, a mental mutant, not a physical mutant, then they, the heroes have to go looking for the real answer. And, and some of the chapter titles are actually like, oh, I know, or the answer that satisfied, or the answer that seemed cool, or the, and the final is the, an <laughs> the answer that was true, because everyone thinks they have the solution and they're wrong. And that's in the third book. So there's a, Asimov is not in himself the greatest of writers. But in pursuing this enlightenment ideal that mathematics can shape our future in the hands of the right people, it, it, it's a good introduction. You can just say, yeah, enlightenment, that. Oh, okay. Just like with <laughs> Kantian philosophy. <laughs> Matrix? Yeah, that. <laughs> well, there's my recommendation. There we go. Right. At least the first book in the, in the series. All right. Thank you guys so much. This has been great. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to our financial supporters. We appreciate you helping keep the show rolling. If you would like to join their number, by the way, you can visit our website, which is anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Uh, write us an email. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can reach us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Hope to see you next week.